A hearty good evening and welcome to the session on all about uterine fibroids. We are glad to have Dr. Maitri Sharan among us today to help us understand the topic. She will take us through that and more in this session today. Doctor, you have the stage. Hi, I'm Dr. Maitri Sharan, gynecologist. Uh, I'm working as a consultant in Dr. Lokrandil Jubilee Hills. Today we will go talk about everything about the fibroids. That is uh, today's topic. So I hope uh, you will understand uh, at least something about the fibroids and uh, you will come to the gynecologist whenever you have the problem. So key topics today in this presentation we are going to discuss what are fibroids first thing, second thing why the fibroids develop and types of fibroids and symptoms and how are fibroids we diagnose and management and precautions which we have to take in this session. Okay so so what are the fibroids? These are mostly non-cancerous growths that develop in and around the womb. Okay, this growth, basically, these are all turning to cancer are very, very rare. Okay, so and this is the most common problem which the patients come to the clinic in our daily to daily. Okay, and the growth, basically, these are the growths which are come from the muscle tissue and also the fibrous tissue and they already vary in the size. They're also called as uterine myomas and also leomyoma. So you can see here the fibroids when on in the normal uterus. Coming to the why fibroids develop. Actually, though we are a gynecologist, even the cause we don't know. Uh, so the exact cause of the fibroids is unknown. But um, one thing we are very sure, it is a estrogen dependent. That's the reason it is most common in the reproductive age group. That is like um, in the up to before the menopause and once the estrogen comes down that is in the menopause the fibroids get shrunk so that's the reason we usually know that is a estrogen dependent coming to the genetic reasons you can see like if your mother grandmother or if your aunt someone is having we are we can see that is more common if your mother or grandmother or any of your family is having the fibroids so in that way the genetic plays a role and especially we can see in the high bmi high bmi why because uh, if the uh, if you have obesity or anything, uh, the fat converts to estrogen and estrogen, and this estrogen will helps for the development of the fibroids. And coming to the races, this is like um, uh, Black Americans and uh, Africans is more common these fibroids. So coming to the reason, as I told, the exact cause is not known. So you, so because the why I mentioned about this, most of the people ask like why I got this fibroids, why other people are not having, why I'm not having. So when you ask this question, it's mostly unknown. But one thing is estrogen dependent. Okay, coming to the types of fibroids. So you can see this is the normal uterus and this is next to this is her fibroid. So the intramural fibroid is the fibroid, which is the most common thing which we seen in the OPDs or in the clinics. So basically the intramural fibroid is present inside the muscle. Okay, which develop in the muscle of the womb and it causes most of the time it causes the bleeding problems like excessive bleeding or heavy periods and all caused because of the intramural fibroids. Coming to the second one is subserosal fibroids. This comes from the outer layer of the uterine serosa. Okay, these are called uterine serosa outer layer and it develops outside only. You can see here the marker and sometimes, you know, they get stock and they become as pedunculator. And these are very um, safe, actually, when the fibroids comes and that to subserosal, usually you don't have much symptoms. But the only thing is they, uh, they tend to become very large compared to other type of the fibroids. Coming to the submucosal fibroid, these are called submucosal. They actually, they, are in, they develop from the muscle, but sometimes enter into the cavity. And these are the most common thing which affects like bleeding problems and also the infertility problems because you understood, right? It is inside the cavity. Obviously, it affects when you are uh, trying for the pregnancy or uh, infertility problems or once you become pregnant and uh, implantation and all becomes problem with the subserosal fibroids. And even it causes sometimes like uh, uh, when it gets infected, it may present with the uh, discharge and all continuous discharge. 
So three types which are very important that is intramural fibroid which grows inside the muscle, uh, subserosal which grows from the layer outside the layer of the uterus that is serosal layer and which gets pedunculated and like becomes pedunculated subserosal and third one is submucosal which is inside the uterine cavity that is inside the womb okay. These are the type of the fibroids. Coming to the symptoms, when it comes to the symptoms, most of the patients are asymptomatic when they come to us. That means how they find out they have the fibroid. Most of the people don't know that they have the fibroid for so many years also. How they will find out, maybe they in the accidentally or if we do routine examinations or if they have gone for other pain and they routinely found out they have the fibroids is the most common problem that comes to us. Second thing is other set of people comes to us like with the heavy bleeding which are very painful periods and having severe lower back ache and some people feel uh, as I said the types of fibroids some people have anterior fibroids which are compressing the bladder sometimes the patient may say that they are uh, having frequent need of to urinate and sometimes difficulty in passing the urine and all and if the fibroids are posterior in the men's uh, as you know, like the uh, uterus is between the bladder and uh, rectum. So if it is anterior, it compresses on the bladder and causes frequent urination or difficulty in passing the urine. If it is in the posterior, it will cause the constipation and all the rectal related problems. So fibroid can also affect the pregnancy. Like I said, submucosal uh, fibroids, which may affect the pregnancy or sometimes it may cause the infertility also. So coming to the how we diagnose the fibroids. So as I told, like accidentally routine tests are the most common things which uh, people comes to us and says that they have uh, diagnosed with the fibroids. This is the most common thing. So when they come with the fibroids, we take detailed history. In the history, we include like a, uh, about the cycles, how they are uh, having the periods, how uh, are they having heavy periods. Like we want to know the symptoms, basically, how they are being affected, like um, how they are uh, bleeding and is that bleeding is normal or if it is heavy or if it is associated with any, any clots or anything, we will be usually uh, asking in the history and any family history associated and all, they will be examined. And coming to the examination, we do per speculum and per vaginal, which is internal examination. And uh, we will be knowing whether the uterus is bulky or not, whether we have the fibroids and where we all we can come to one clinical uh, thing. And after that, usually we ask for the scan when the clinical, uh, we want to correlate the clinical and scan findings along with the symptomatic findings. If in some cases to map out the fibroids before the surgery, we usually uh, ask for the MRI, but routinely we don't ask for the MRI. Only for the specific cases, we go for the advanced tests like the MRI. Otherwise, we take a routine scan and our clinical examination is uh, enough. So coming to the how are fibroids treated, I want to mention and give importance to this point that not all fibroids need to be treated because uh, if you see the fibroid you should not get panic because we don't need to treat all the fibroids one thing and all the fibroids need not to be uh, need uh, need to be removed by the surgery okay there are different mode of treatments and uh, different type of things nowadays we are in the advanced stage we have to know that there are different things which you have to focus so not alone thinking like okay i have a fibroid i have to remove the uterus it's not nothing like that okay so sometimes you know even small fiber it depends upon so many things like i mentioned treatment depends upon different things so whenever we see the fibroid, even if it is a if uh, it is a small size and it is not affecting the patient anyway, if the patient is symptomatic, it is always better not to touch. Okay. So coming to the treatment, how we decide uh, the treatment for the fibroids? Like it depends upon the age of the patient, whether the patient is like early reproductive age or the patient is like. Um, perimenopausal age or we, what type of age like uh, where is the patient standing like we have to know okay it decides the, uh, the mode of the treatment because um, if you want to go for the conservative management or if you are trying for the pregnancy whatever it depends all on the age of the patient second size of the fibroid usually less than four centimeters of the size of the fibroid are nothing to worry and usually we don't need surgeries for those type of the fibroid if the patient is also not having symptoms 
coming to the location as i told like uh, some fibroids even though are very small very small even 1 cm 2 cm but they are troubling because they are compressing your the uh, urinary bladder and all they have to be uh, has to be addressed so based on the location also we decide uh, the mode of the treatment coming to the fibroids is number of the fibroids sometimes uh, if you have 2 cm fibroid but multiple Mm, so that is not an issue when you don't have the symptoms so and so another thing is symptoms so even sometimes you know even small fibroid cause tiny fibroid cause too many symptoms for the patient like heavy bleeding painful bleeding or in between bleeding and all but some patients having large fibroids also they don't know that they are having big sitting fibroid also does not cause harm so based on the symptoms also we decide for the treatment of the patient and the last one is desire for the pregnancy having all these things into notice if the patient is willing uh, for pregnancy and if there are infertility issues that mode of the treatment also changes so when we are planning for the treatment of the fibroid we take into consideration of all these factors just not like the blanket treatment for everyone coming to the management of the fibroids so the same these are the common questions which the patient ask i kept here in this slide do all the fibroids need surgery not really like i always say no or uh, if the fibroids are very small and not causing any problems that is like symptom lips you should it's always better not to touch the fibroids second is medical management a medical management i all i always mention this medical management like we have lot of options like gnrh agonist antagonist and some drugs like ulipristal acetate and merina and all but one thing is like this fibroids where with this medical management is only temporary that means this medical management is not going to shrink to zero size or completely remove the fibroids but how how it helps is like it will it may not increase the size of the fibroids unless you are on those drugs but we cannot take those drugs for the longer duration right so we will see like uh, when we can go for the medical management and how many years we want to try and what is the use of this we will these drugs cannot be taken by themselves by the gynecologist advice the doctor will see and will advise these drugs coming to the other most common drugs which we give is tranexamic acid or methionic acid which are like posmf and all this really reduces the bleeding and the pain associated with the fibroids but these are also for the temporary related reasons only but this cannot give the permanent cure coming to the surgical management like i said we have medical management things but also there is something called surgical management this is not for all the patients when all the medical management fails and when all the medical management tried and we still are not able to uh, control the symptoms then we have to go for the surgical management surgical management are of two types that is one is conservative management uh, in the sense uh, without removal of the uterus we remove only the fibroids which is called as myomectomy it also depends upon the age again the consideration is like whether the patient is pregnant uh, planning for the pregnancy and all those cases we go for the only removal of the fibroid and even um, other cases like recently i have we have done operated for 33 years who has fin finished her family but she's still 33 and having fibroids so in those cases instead of um, removal of whole uterus we go for the myomectomy and removal of the uterus when all the pro uh, procedures done and still the patient is symptomatic and the size of the fibroid is huge and the age is also not in uh, uh, reproductive age then we will go for the uh, hysterectomy and these both above types of surgery can be done open methods and that is like but through the cut on the abdomen or through the laparoscopy laparoscopy is always far met better method than the open method Uh, even for the large fibroids, we go for the laparoscopy method. In the laparoscopy, usually the stay is less and the recovery is also very fast. And we usually keep uh, very small cuts over the abdomen so that uh, future reductions and also were less. And definitely, there is a lot of advantages when we compare with the laparoscopy method than the open method. So it depends on uh, where is the fibroid and all and previous uh, surgeries and all. We decide. and we go for any type of the surgery these are the surgical management things
coming to the non-invasive treatments, there are uh, some advanced methods which you have to know other than the surgical and medical management, which are called as MR-guided HIFU, which called is a high-intensity focused ultrasound. Here we use the waves of sound waves that uh, to reduce the size of the fibroids. This is a non-invasive method. Uh, this also has its own things. Not all the uh, patients are fit for this. And another method is called uterine artery embolization. Here we send the uh, certain particles through the blood vessels and uh, we try to focus on the vessels uh, supplying the fibroid and this will help to shrink the size of the fibroid. These are the other methods and this also has its own pros and cons and this also have indications and contraindications for certain things. So which you can ask your gynecologist and if you're fit for those things, you can also go for those methods. Coming to the precautions, so so many people ask me though, we say like um, they have medical and surgical management, people ask us like what are the precautions which we can take, one thing is there is a, uh, yeah, there is no natural method to reduce the size of the fibroid, but still we can take the precautions like uh, eat iron rich food and uh, dried apricots, bananas, raisins and figs which are there in the which will not help to improve the size of the fibroid. So these uh, type of foods definitely will help to reduce the size of the fibroids. Coming to the foods which we have to avoid, as I said, the foods which we can eat, and there are also foods which we have to avoid. That is, we know that fibroids are basically uh, estrogen dependent uh, tumors. So um, we have to avoid the estrogen rich diet that is like processed foods and all and especially the soya rich food all things you have to reduce because soya has estrogen component so that may increase the fibroids so we should avoid soya rich foods and alcohol and plastic packaged foods and water i always mention about this plastic packaged thing because this plastic package uh uh, actually releases some product called as xenoestrogen which mimics like our natural estrogen and tries to enter into the body and it has um, it makes our uh, estrogen dependent tumors to grow that's the reason you have to avoid the plastic related products and all now coming to that i all and one more most important and for every patient i say that exercise regularly it's no need to be very fancy in re exercising you can no need to join the Pilates, yoga, like as always I mentioned, it's regular walking is just enough. Everyday brisk walking for 30 minutes is itself is enough and keeping your weight under check is also very important. So thank you. If you have any questions, please post here so that I can help you. Okay, Shivani saying no questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you then.